Yeah. About, about 3.30 or 3.45, the food is going to be delivered. Uh, and, uh, so I, I, I'm just kind of wondering what would be the best thing for us to do during this last half hour. Uh, I'm on page 3 of 14. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not going to try to rush through all of this. I think one of the things that I might do is talk about some of the things that I brought with a few little helpful hints for us. I do think it's good to bring the Bible, at the very least the New Testament. Um, I would recommend getting a small and light one. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to bring this or not because I, I haven't brought the Old Testament before, but there are some times and some things that could be helpful. I do recommend the new revised edition of the New American Bible. The New American Bible. There's an app on the phone that has the Bible. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, but I don't know if it's a new American Bible. It has a ton of them. Let me see. Yeah. Whatever. But you, know, you, can, uh, you, you, you can get the new American Bible on Kindle, which you can also get on, read on your phone. Um, so, you know, actually, what I'm going to do will be to bring my uh, bring bring my uh, uh, I have a Zoom tablet. And I've got the Bible on it. So now that I'm thinking of it, I don't have to even worry about this. The neat thing about the New American Bible is it does have excellent, excellent introductions. Each book has an introduction that is pretty well up to date as far as the, uh, uh, the description of the book. And I will probably be sneaking a look more often than not at uh, those introductions when I'm wanting to get my dates and facts and all of that uh, straight as far as, uh, as far as these things. So, a Bible will be good. New American Bible I, is the one that I most recommend. That's the translation we use in church as well. Uh, some of you asked about a map. Right now, the newest one out and probably the most accessible is a Globetrotter travel map. Um, I didn't know one of the very, very best of the more detailed, this is much more detailed uh, uh, maps, is, is the uh, Freytag and Berndt. It's, it's a German company. Uh, uh, I used to be able to find this at Borders or, um, or Barnes & Noble. I haven't found one there in a long time. Uh, in fact, this particular one I did not find uh, on uh, on Amazon either. This one is relatively inexpensive, nine dollars on Amazon. It's hard to find a Barnes and Noble. Yes. So where did you find that one? The borders. This one. No, no, borders. This one. Uh, this. One, I, I. You know. I think I ordered. I think I got this about a year and a half, two years ago at uh, at, at Amazon. What, what is, can you spell the name of that? I'm sorry. Freytag. Ray. Thank you. So, um, there aren't that many good maps, good road maps of Turkey. You'll find some road maps of Turkey when you get there uh, in, in some of the truck stop type places that we'll be at and, 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 and things, places like that. For St. Paul, uh, as you know, I burn candles at the shrine of Jerome Murphy O'Connor. <laughs> he has uh, three books, two of which I highly recommend. One, the other one is interesting. The one that's interesting is Jesus and Paul Parallel Lives. What he does is take various themes and shows how the life of Paul and the life of Jesus have certain parallel characteristics, such as, he says, in contradiction to many scholars, they were the same age. 
They were ripped from their roots. They were both childhood refugees. They had to adapt to an alien environment. And the two alien environments are, for Jesus, Sephoris. How many of you ever heard of Sephoris or Sephoris? Yeah, I've heard the name. The scripture scholars have back there. Um, that was a, a Roman town that was being built in Jesus' childhood about five or six miles from Nazareth. It's mentioned nowhere in the Bible. It's not known much in tradition. It's recently been studied and excavated quite a bit. But Joseph the carpenter, you know the carpenter was? A construction worker. It was not, you know, we, we think of Joseph probably in his little woodworking shop building tables and chairs for the villagers. <laughs> That's probably not the case, although he certainly had that skill and would, would be able to do that. But he would have been a construction worker. Probably both Jesus and Joseph would commute every morning that five miles from Nazareth to Sephoris and work on the Roman projects of building the city and come back. And, uh, if you're aware that that was something that was fairly likely, Jesus would have um, learned a lot of the broader social conditions of the Jews during the Roman times. Uh, a lot of which he uses in his parables. You know, about the wealthy landowner. Uh, a lot of his, many of his parables have a country setting. Some of them have an urban setting. Uh, a lot of them have to do with the relationship of civic officials to peasants, to the ordinary people. Uh, read through the parables of Jesus and you'll see a lot of, a lot of hints of, um, of the kind of life that, that Jesus would have lived in a small town a little bit too far from a large town being built which was a Roman center uh, of, of culture and trade and power. Um, they both had temporary vocations as prophet and Pharisee, commitment to the law. Each one had a secondary, second conversion, which he talks about. Uh, Jesus grew up as, um, as being faithful to the law and then saw himself as the fulfillment of the law. So transcending the law. Uh, and then both were executed by the Romans. So, it's a, it, this is kind of an interesting, um, interesting work. This is his latest also, uh, Jesus and Paul. The classic that he did was Paul, A Critical Life. This is the one that has all the scholarly stuff. Footnotes galore and uh, goes into a lot of details. This one, Paul, his story is told kind of like a biographical novel. He doesn't have a bunch of footnotes, he just tells the story. So this one may well be the more accessible. Paul, his story. Three others that I can actually recommend. Um, Edward Storton, a um, British filmmaker, uh, did a series for the BBC on Paul. And uh, this is the book that results from it. And it's really, really quite well done. And he tends to follow Murphy O'Connor's chronology, which is, which is good. What's the name of that book, though? Oh, I'm sorry. Paul of Tarsus. Paul of Tarsus, A Visionary Life. A Visionary Life. Um, Paul, the Least of the Apostles, is a bit more of a theological, devotional one, but it, it uh, definitely goes through his biography. And uh, St. Paul, Traveler and Roman Citizen, is sort of like, well, a whole bunch of pictures of places that we're going to see as we go through here. So it's your kind of book. And uh, so I haven't actually read this one yet, but it looks it looks quite interesting. 
conclude our day, any loose ends, any particular questions that you would like me to, uh, to talk about in the last 15 or 20 minutes? Last time, when last we met, you mentioned tipping, and you were going to talk about tipping of the bus driver and our tour guide mm -hmm. for the whole. Mm -hmm. Okay, the recommended uh, tip, I believe, for the tour guide is the equivalent of five dollars a day per person. And for the bus driver, three dollars a day per person. And we'll have the same guide and the same driver. We will have the same guide and same driver the whole time. Now, I'd like to propose that, and you'll see why when we get there. As the minimum, um, the reason is there is no tour guide like Iden anywhere in the entire world, mm -hmm. and. Um, everybody falls in love with it. So, I think... Um, and, and this should be in, in their money, or do they either. accept their own money? It, 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 it can be in either. I'll, it can I'll, be I'll, in get, either. I'll get to that in a moment. Okay. The bus driver, we have not encountered a bad bus driver. They have all been friendly. They have been helpful. They are responsible for moving tons of our stuff on and off the bus every time we uh, arrive at or leave from a hotel. Um, they are very safe. Um, one of the things that is a little bit frustrating when you're wanting to go on a really, really good road, and many of them are, mm -hmm. a long distance, is that they are limited to uh, 100 kilometers um, an hour. No. They're limited to 90 kilometers an hour, which is about 50 miles an hour, uh, 50, 55. So, you know, when you think, oh, on this road they could easily go 70 and we could get there um, a half hour, an hour earlier, they can't do that. They really are quite safe and excellent drivers, and uh, they know how to... They know very well how to get around. And so, you know, again, three dollars a day per person I think would be would be a minimum. Let your heart be your guide. The other thing is that of course is a good way to get rid of extra lira on as you're leaving. But um, you may possibly pick up some euros along the way. Uh, you may have some dollars that you would like to give them. They always appreciate dollars, especially now that there's more inflation happening in Turkey. Is the dollars okay? So American. How about taxis? American if you ever need a taxi, do they take dollars? Um, <laughs> probably not. But you probably won't need one except in the in the. Uh, uh, you know, those last four days. But other than that, you won't need a taxi. Are the, are the ATMs dependable over there? The ATMs are dependable. Um, within the several square block area of the hotel, um, there are, I would say, at least a half a dozen banks, and they all have ATMs outside. And they are, therefore, they're associated with the banks. So they are well cared for. They're not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest at all isolated ATMs somewhere, you know, out in a touristy area. Uh, the banks, there's a lot of banks. They're all over the place. And um, they have um, uh, trustworthy, reliable ATMs. Okay. Along with that, though, kind of a weird question. When we use the ATMs there, do we put in the American dollars we want? You put in the Turkish lira, they will make the conversion. Okay. Yeah. So in other words, you uh -huh. you, you you might you know you, you you can punch in fifty lira, hundred lira, two hundred, three hundred, five hundred, okay. whatever, and then it will spit out the the, the lira, and then the conversion 
plus whatever your ATM bank fee will be. Um, and the first time I went, you know, there was no ATM bank fee. You know, now there is. <laughs> okay. Um, it might be redundant in the last meeting, which I wasn't at, of course. Um, I know the, the airline has baggage restrictions. How about the bus? How about that? No. 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 We are on, I think, a, um, I think it's a 47 passenger bus, and we are 27 people. So, um, so there will be a bit of elbow room. Okay. Uh, when we arrive at airports, coming or going, uh, will all the baggage, baggage be together and somebody will take it, or do we take our own baggage somewhere? To a bus you, or whatever. Well, going there, we arrive at Ataturk International Airport. Uh -huh. Returning, we arrive at LAX. Yeah. So, um, what what we will do in in both places, really? You know, we're we're really fortunate that we don't have to go through customs in New York or something like that. Uh -huh. That's right. the pits. <laughs> so. Uh, Here's, here's the narrative. When we get off the plane in Istanbul, we'll go down the corridors, however far, wherever the, wherever the gate is, um, to the passport control area. On the left side of the passport control area is the visa area. Um, so you have to go and purchase your visa uh, Turkish visa uh, at that area before you go through passport control. The Turkish visa is about the size of a large postage stamp. It's a sticker that will just go into a blank page on your passport. You pay $20 American. They will not take Turkish lira. Um, I think you can pay 15 euros but I don't think they like that from Americans. They okay. like American dollars. So $15 or $20 American. Then you go from there into the passport control. And there's two clearly marked sections for Turkish citizens and non-Turkish citizens. Obviously, we go to, through the Turkish, uh, the non-Turkish. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see if you're awake. So, and you know, you go up to the window there, and the, the uh, unsmiling uh, uh, agent. customs agent yeah. will you know look at you, look down at your passport, <laughs> leaf through it, run it through his scanner, look back up at you, um, open it to the page where the uh, sticker is, the, the visa sticker, stamp it with a date and then hand it off to you, and equally unsmiling, we'll say, welcome to Turkey. <laughs> uh, from there, we go to the baggage claim, and I think it's relatively unlikely that our bags will end up in Timbuktu because they don't have to be transferred anywhere. You know, so they go onto the plane, and then they're taken off the plane there. So with luck, most of us should be able to get our bags. There have been some horror stories about that in the past, especially with Delta. Uh, and once, once we pick up our bags, if you want to get some Turkish lira, right by the baggage claim carousel, there is a, a, a money exchange um, counter. Uh, they probably gouge you, I'm not really sure, but I suspect that you're not going to get your best deal there. If you feel more comfortable having some Turkish lira uh, rustling in your pocket, um, fine, get some. But I don't think you'll really need it. Okay, then pick up your bags and go through customs. Customs there are several counters with somebody standing behind it, half awake, sort of just maybe going like this. You know. In other words, uh, I've never ever had the experience of anybody's baggage being examined or ever seen anybody's baggage being examined at the customs in Istanbul. 
unlike the United States. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and then you go through two doors, and there will be probably our um, uh, a welcoming person from from Ersan's office. Um, uh, probably a guy by the name of Sarder. He's the one who's usually greeted us, and he accompanies the bus. Now, we will have to wait probably about 45 minutes or an hour because there are, I, I don't remember who they are, but somebody is arriving um, about 45 minutes after us. There will also be several people who will have arrived about 45 minutes before us. But welcome. Hello, Father Thompson. Hello. Hi. Thank you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Hello. 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 So this is our our meal. Should I take them to your back? Yes, please. Um, and uh, let me see. We. Uh, so we may have to wait there for a little while, but we will be grouped all together. We'll, we'll, everybody who is on the pilgrimage will be meeting at the airport at that time. So we will all be able to take the same bus <laughs> back to um, uh, back to um, the the Madison Hotel, and nobody is going to have to you know worry about trying to get a taxi or something like that. Okay, coming back when we go through customs, do we have to declare, well, what do we declare, everything we bought in Turkey, or how does that work? It depends work? on how honest you want to be. <laughs> no, I think they, they have still $400. $400? $400. $400. $400. $400. $400. $400. $400. They'll give you a disembarkation card on the plane before you land, and you fill it out, and you put the value of everything you bought. Okay. You know, I mean, a lot of people get two receipts when they're traveling, one to present and one to, that's the real one, you know. Yeah. Because you, some things, like if you buy something that's an antique or something like that, you know, um, you can put old doll or something, you know, five dollars, and even though you might have paid a hundred dollars for it, you know, it it's already been taxed. For a thousand years, you know. <laughs> so, but I think the limit's four hundred dollars. Four hundred dollars. You probably so, yeah. don't have, and, and and then they value things a little bit differently yeah, than, yeah. That, than than than. Yeah. You probably don't have to worry in the least bit if you're just buying ordinary souvenir stuff. Yeah. Okay. Now, if you really want to buy something expensive, like for example, if you want to put down fifteen thousand dollars worth of carpets. Yeah. or something like that, which has been known to be done, or jewelry, usually the person selling it will help you with the customs declaration. The carpets, and um, you know, we go to a, uh, a ceramic place where he has some very nice, very expensive stuff. If it's too large and bulky, to be, he'll ship it. Right. And then they take care of the, you know, the customs declaration. Okay. But, you know, if, yeah. if you buy a few hundred dollars worth of souvenirs mm -hmm. and that kind yeah. of stuff, yeah, I, would, I would say nobody is going to. Yeah, they don't. Going, going to. Well, quite a few the jewelry. Can you buy any jewelry? Yeah. Is there more, or do I? Uh, I drop over all of them, Father Stone. All of them? I can come later on if you like. No, I just can not Okay, I'm going to see some of it. Yes, sir. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What if you do uh, purchase uh, over the four hundred dollar limit? What if you purchase over the four hundred dollar limit? Yeah. I would say not to worry about it if it's four hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah, right. I'd say if if you have a whole bunch of little stuff that just would total, you know, over that, I don't think anybody's going to. Right. I mean, if you buy clothing. 
Yeah. You put it in with your clothes. Oh, yeah. yeah. You buy jewelry, you wear it. You wear it. Yeah. 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 If you buy jewelry, don't take jewelry. You know, it's not, it's not like um, uh, uh, the IRS where, um, you know, they have to send a report of what they sell to you to the agency and then, you know, you have to. So, but I, but I think if it's something, you know. This is more concerned with people who are buying things to, come to America and sell them. Right, right. This yeah. is the, the kind of, it's more for, not for us touristy, it's for people who own businesses and are bringing back stuff to really sell for a profit. Yeah. Not to give away to, to family. Be very careful about any kind of food. So I've had people have um, have food things um, confiscated. Now, there too, um, many of the places that sell food for tourists, like at the uh, uh, the Spice Bazaar, they will package it in a in, in a way that uh, will pass through without uh, that they say will pass through without causing problems, but. How about the value added tax, the VAT? Because when you go to Europe and you shop and it's more than certain amount, then you can get your tax back, but you have to... Theoretically, you're supposed to be able to do that. Now, okay, okay. bye, Joy. Okay. Uh, bye. bye. Uh, theoretically, you're supposed to be able to do that. I've never done that, but I guess, you know, I don't know what... what I've done do, do you know anything about it? In coming from England, but it was a, I, I bought enough items that it was worth it to claim it. Mm -hmm. um, but the value added tax in England is uh, what it was 17.5 the last time I went. I think they've raised it. Mm. It's quite sizable if you're buying things that are worth hundreds of dollars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but. But there is a form. You can probably yeah. get it at the customs office. Mm -hmm. at the store. But then, of course, if you claim that you've spent this much and you want the value added tax back, you know, it's it's going to somewhere be uh, yeah. accountable because you're claiming you didn't buy any more than four hundred dollars. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I've, I've, I have no experience whatsoever with that, and I think most of the most of the places. At least where we go as 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 a group that you know sell us big ticket items. Well, they deduct the value added tax anyway, mm -hmm. you know, for for export. But I, you know, again, I just really don't know. Yeah. Like for example, if you buy carpets, they will shift them here. Um, so you're not you're not paying the tax, nor are you paying customs, or it's included in the. Unless you buy them at a, you know, at Joe's carpet shop in the in the Grand Bazaar, uh, well, then you're sort of on your own there. You and Joe. You and Joe. You make a sport coat. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, we do. We also do go to a leather a leather factory, a leather show. So, uh, you want to get a sport coat? Anything else? Do we ever need to wear a skirt? So we will tip talk this. No. Yeah. Okay. No, I don't think you ever. Uh, uh, um, the, what do they call them? Pedal pushers like this? Yeah. 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 I'm yeah. 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 Generally speaking, I don't think that's too much of a problem either. But uh, shorts above the knee, I would say there's no need, no, no reason to. Um, and, uh, uh, that's not to go sleeveless. Is this sleeveless? That's sleeveless. So at least a little bit. Of <laughs> at least a little bit for the for the moss. But then again, the weather will be chilly enough that you'll probably want a little more. I'm going to take I'm going to take light sweaters. Layers, layers, layers. Buy those in a raincoat over that. I have a very light um, raincoat. Amazon. I always do Amazon. I can get the room full. Do anybody want? That I, I need tags, three. I got okay. Oh, oh. Okay. Sure. I've got them here. I want. I want two tags. Well, let, well yeah, why don't we just conclude by saying together the Lord's Prayer, and then let's go and have uh, grace, and then let's go and eat. Okay. okay. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Bless us, O Lord. And these ideas which we are about to receive from thy bounty. 